I have the great pleasure of introducing tonight our keynote speaker, Greg Pascarelli. Greg is the co-founder of SHOP, a think tank that has pushed the designer's realm past form making and into software design. Real estate development, construction, and the co-development of new sustainable technologies. SHOP has long been a leader in pushing the limits of the digital, beginning long ago when I first knew Greg as a very provocative young student at Columbia in the early days of the paperless studio experiments. The partners of SHOP developed a sophisticated trajectory very early in their careers when they won the first prestigious PS1 competition. For me, it set a standard which has yet to be matched. Building upon these impressive beginnings, they developed the first publications around the idea of the iterative practice an idea which is the mainstay of most edu educational practices today. I asked Greg to be the keynote address for this symposium, in particular because of the innovative ways that CHOP has transformed both the design and the constru construction processes in architecture. They have moved far beyond those early formal experience, experiments at Columbia into materiality and construction processes, and in doing so, are transforming the role of the architect. Shop has attained a goal I remember Greg predicting would be possible more than a decade ago. He predicted very early on that digitization would allow the architect to once again assume the role of the master builder. Greg continues pushing that trajectory every day. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you, Catherine. Um, that's a good thing at least one prediction came out correct. Um, it's, uh, it's always really great to be here at WashU. Um, I know I've told this story before, but I'm going to tell it every time I, I end up here. Um, this is the third time, um, which is that uh, when I was a young punk coming off of Wall Street and really sick and tired of the financial industry because I saw which way it was heading, uh, and I would spend all my days as a banker drawing instead of doing uh, spreadsheets. Um, I walked up to Columbia to the fourth floor and I met a kind of young professor named Robert McCarter who looked at my mess of a portfolio, uh, shredded me to pieces and gave me the most constructive criticism one could ever get. And uh, when I redid that portfolio, I was lucky enough to be admitted to Columbia. And so for that, I will be forever grateful. Um, I think that uh, when Catherine and, and I were, when I was a student, and then when we taught together also, it was, it was a very unusual time at Columbia, um, filled with a lot of Wash U graduates and a lot of people that came here uh, before and after. Um, and when Catherine asked me to give this talk tonight, she said, you know, even go back to some of the old stuff and how it connects to this. And so, um, I don't know, like, uh, you know, I'm not the kind of guy that goes back and thinks about what happened a long time ago, but I opened up some files that really scared the crap out of me, and um, uh, I'm going to show them tonight, so. <laughs> so. It's all therapy. It's, it's all therapy, exactly, but, you know, I, don't, I can't afford $175 an hour right now. So, um, anyway. Uh, you know, I, I showed this slide because it's really kind of the core of what got shop going and together. And it was this, you know, this is our sort of uh, semi-tongue-in-cheek synopsis of what happened to architecture in the last 150 years or 200 years. And for us, the big issue became, you know, in sort of the 80s and, and 90s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, this division, right? And this, this idea that when, and when we were in school, there were people that sort of said this to you, like, are you going to learn how to actually make buildings or are you going to do like phenomenal competitions and teach, but you couldn't somehow do both? And that there was this real division between paper architecture and service architecture. And not that one is better than the other, but we just didn't really understand why there was this kind of choice. And I think that um, the five of us came together with a goal of trying to make a, a firm that was equally proficient in both. Um, we've been at it for 16 or 17 years now and we're still struggling with it every day, but it's absolutely the, the sort of fuel of the fire that burns us. Um, so, you know, it became this notion of a, of a both and firm and, and what did that mean? And we came together not because we um, like all drew the same kind of stuff or uh, because we were drinking buddies or whatever the reasons are that people make uh, make partnerships, but it was really a kind of 
mutual respect for what um, for what we did and for what we could for, for the things that we were interested in and, and this notion of trying to become a both and firm and what did that mean. So for those of you who may or may not know, the, the five original founding partners of SHOP are kind of an unusual family tree. The, 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 the partnership is made up of two married couples and the identical twin brother of one of the husbands. Um, so there are Bill and Chris Sharpless, uh, who are identical twins, although one pronounces it Sharples and the other pronounces it Sharpless, and they fight constantly about it. <laughs> Um, uh, Corey, Corey Sharpless is married to Bill, um, and Kim Holden is one of the partners, and, um, and I'm married to Kim, and sh that's where Shop came from. Although, we took our names off the firm very early on, uh, just because we didn't want it to be about us, we wanted it to be about this kind of think tank, this, this place that you could come and try to think about architecture in lots of different ways. But one of the key things, um, you know, right at the beginning was this notion of, um, you know, I, I think we were fortunate. We sort of came out of school at a moment when there was a bit of a paradigm shift going on. And it was basically that computers were getting fast enough and cheap enough that they were useful to architects and could be afforded by architects. And so there was, some, a, lot of, there was a lot of great experimentation early on. And, and you know, I, 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 I dug deep into the archives to find some of these images that we were, that we were talking about. This is 1995, 96, 97, where we were thinking about fractals, we were thinking about geometry, we were thinking about the relationship to, 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 um, to buildings and shapes. We were looking at nature, we were looking at product design, we were looking at differentiation. And we were trying to think about ways that you could learn lessons from nature and bring them to the design of products and bring them to an idea of, of the multiple in making. We looked at technology and its relationship to nature and, and looked at this kind of idea of the relationship between form and performance. And th these are all the early ideas. We, we had no idea what this was going to be as an architecture. So I mean, I'm really, you know, it's like I, feel I am in therapy right now. It's like deep into childhood, talking our, our architectural childhood about the things that sort of motivated us when we were starting. But I think that one thing that we started to learn as we were looking to the past and to history was this constant notion that every time there was a new material or a new technology, it sort of enabled a new way of putting things together, of manufacturing, of assembly, and then the kinds of things that could come out of it. But what really interested us was not the geometric form. It was not the kinds of rules or breaking rules of geometry for the formal resolution of architecture. For us, it really became what could the building do and how would it be made? And very quickly, it got us excited about what does an architect really do? Because we don't build buildings. We make instruction sets for other people to build buildings. We talk to clients to try and solve problems, or we deal with cities, or we think about art, or we think about space, and we try and make these drawings that begin to tell us something else about what is going to be there in the future. And so very early, our, our research was going into challenging the notion of what plan, section, and elevation meant. Um, 17 years later, what I would say was plans and sections are still useful, and elevations are totally useless. But <laughs> Um, you know, it, it very quickly then got us connected into thinking about making and that we, if we were going to be the both and firm, we could really have fun in all the theory and teaching and drawing all of these things, but it was very, very important to us. And I think to, to a generation of architects who were emerging at that time, many of whom you'll be hearing from tomorrow, we, we all got very interested in making and moving away from the paper architecture. Um, um, what you see on the left, I love this drawing. I, th I think this is at MIT, this photograph. This is a, a, the original lofting. Uh, the loft, lofting came from laying out the sails in the lofts to draw the complex shapes of the sails. It's obviously something that we use in our software packages today. But this is the original lofting exercises for the SR-71. And on the right, that is the first CNC uh, object ever made, 1961, um, which I think is kind of cool. But so sort of as the late 90s were emerging, not only were the computers, so the computers started the whole paperless studio idea, this idea that you could think about just the form and the generation of the form, the rendering of the form. But that was right at the moment where we were starting to teach. And we always felt that 
the, the, while, while provocative and interesting and a valuable exercise, for us it was really about not being, it was, it, it, you could be paperless, but that didn't mean that you were objectless. And so it very, very quickly became this idea of trying to extract experimental form from the computer and see how it could be made. So now a couple years later, this machinery starts to become fast enough and cheap enough uh, that architects could afford it. Um, we actually bought our first 3D printer in 1998. We were a firm of five people and had one 3D printer. SOM was 600 and had zero. And we were really psyched about that. We were like, okay, this is, this is, how, we could, this is how we can go after the big guys. If we could stay ahead of them on the, on the technology curve, it'll give us a chance to go in there to rethink the ideas of making and we'll have a shot at, at, at going after larger projects. But when we were looking at all this stuff, I mean, it really worked at the model scale. And you have to understand, this is just like radical at the time to, to have this available to students. But, but we also didn't even know how, what you could do to make it. And I found the first, from my first studio, a series of drawings where we started to talk to the students about what all of these actions meant. And maybe it's my own personal neuroses, but I kind of try to relate everything back to food at some point. So there's a, a kind of performative food model on the right in each one of these types, where we started talking about how you looked at complex objects and what the motions that one could do digitally, and then how that could translate into a CNC process to begin to make form. And so these were what we were calling the CNC food groups and how we could begin to think about organizing uh, spatial relationships, um, drawing them, building the models, and executing them. Uh, that's a cookie puss from Carvel ice cream, for those of you who don't know that. Um, one of the most bizarre things of all time. Um, but then it got to the sort of 3D printing, and, and there was this kind of like dream of the 3D printer that would make a house, you know? And for me, that just felt like mayonnaise. Like, okay, it's just this blob gel that you squirt out of a thing. And that was never what we, I mean, while it's, it's interesting to think that 10, 20, 30 years from now, maybe that's possible, we are 3D printing houses. We wanted to build now, not sort of put all our eggs in the one basket for this dream of, of, of you know, giant mayonnaise jars. So um, I think a lot of, a lot of us we really started to get very, very much into the kind of nitty gritty of taking very simple, various, very available materials and objects and simple processes and seeing what we could do to begin to make buildings. At the same time, we were teaching, and, and these are some of the early studios from Columbia. I brought some images up where we were using things like zoning and rewriting zoning code to become a performative generator of shape. But of course, the immediate thing that we always required in the studios was that you were able to fabricate it. And it's still what we call the triangle offense of, of the way we work at shop, which is you've got to be able to diagram it, you've got to be able to draw it, and you've got to be able to fabricate and build the model for every single design move that you make. And if that idea that you have fails in one of those elements, then it's not a good idea and start over. And, and in that iterative pr process of designing, we constantly do that. What's the diagram for the clarity of the idea? How do you draw that? Almost going back to the food groups. And then how do you build that? How do you extract that from the digital into the actual right away? Um, but these, you know, these early models were really, were really telling to us about that kind of relationship. Um, this, is, uh, this was an amazing project about uh, changing the rules of zoning and, and in, the, in those studios we, we didn't require, you had to draw one plan in one section were the only drawings required. You had to have full assembly, fabrication and assembly drawing sets and you had to have a, a model that could be no less than six feet by four feet by four feet big. That was it. One plan, one section, assembly drawings and a model and a series of diagrams to explain what the building does. So here are the kinds of drawings that, that the students were producing for their, for their architecture classes. Um, and you see the kind of precision and detail with how these things were made. That's like a six foot tall piece of folded steel, stainless steel. I, this image always, I, I hadn't looked at this in more than 10 years. This is, this is not a rendering. This is, this is actual. And we started to laugh because the building started to look more like renderings as we were making them more and more real. And it became this kind of interesting cycle that was, that was emerging. 
you can see the size of these things. It was kind of great. So, so it was such an interesting time as, as the digital was emerging and we were making these connections. Um, um, but there was something that we in the office were, were still not getting to. And it was, there had to be something more than just the generation of form. The way we started thinking about it was to think about, <clears throat> to think about um, program. And um, Catherine mentioned it the first time that we sort of really hit it was, I think, at PS1, where the, um, uh, the program was to create an urban beach. And so the idea that we had was that you didn't necessarily need sand and water for a beach, but you needed a series of programs. So, you know, shading devices, places to change, places to sit, places to dance, and places to get wet. And we took a series of surfaces and mutated those surfaces along their length so that the program would unfold upon that surface. And the surfaces would get joined by the structure. Um, this, was the, um, this is a sort of uh, early BIM, if you will, a kind of 3D model. Let me grab some water. Um, uh, the, we used a very simple system of a kind of AB, AB connection of wooden sticks. So the reds are the A's, the blues are the B's, the purple is where they're overlapping, and all the dimensional uh, uh, changes in the curves are relative to the human body uh, variation in enabling those programs to unfold along, along the surface. But the key thing then was the extraction. By taking that kind of slice model and making these full-scale templated drawings, that's the complete construction document set and each one of these drawings is about 30 feet long by 15 feet high. They were full-scale templates that got laid down. You aligned your sticks according to the colors. You connected them and trimmed off the edges. And very quickly, whoops, very, click, very quickly, all the pieces unfolded and made this, this um, uh, installation piece. Um, we planted a forest of steel trees that would blast every 15 minutes and fill the courtyard with mist. Uh, there were waterfalls, changing rooms, jacuzzis. Um, it was a lot of fun. You could see the sort of transition from a kind of chair to a wall, all arranged uh, based on um, solar, so, solar, solar orientation. And the kind of typical uh, day at PS1, uh, Dunescape, which we did. Now, a sidebar I'll talk about right here, which I think was kind of interesting, was this, um, that the year before we did it, um, an architect named Philip Johnson had done the installation at PS1, and um, he had a $300,000 budget and built a piece, and they got 2,000 people a weekend, and it was a great success, and it was Terry Riley and Alana Heiss, Terry Riley from MoMA and Alana Heiss from PS1, who said, we should really get young architects to do something, which I thought was great, and uh, our budget was uh, $50,000, um, and to do 6,000 square feet of space. We had three weeks to design it and three weeks to build it. And it was, we got probably 60 or 70 articles over this piece. We were, got three or four television spots. It was wildly successful. And at the end of the summer, I was sort of hanging out there and I said to Alana, like, well, how was attendance this year? And she said, it was amazing. We got 8,000 people, we averaged 8,000 people per weekend. And as I was sitting there, I was like, huh. 6,000 additional people per weekend times 12 weeks of the summer times $10 admission plus an average of two beers and a hot dog. We just generated a million dollars of revenue for the museum and our fee was $15,000. And I thought that was very interesting because I started to think about this idea of, of beginning to think about how architecture, design, success, and performance could become linked, uh, not the way that the typical model goes. We'll talk about that later. Um, you know, I think that we tried, these are also, I haven't looked at these drawings in 10 years, maybe longer. This, is, this was the first, um, I don't know if you guys can see the patterns, this light is on here, but this was um, uh, for a, a carousel house that we designed. Our first public project was a park and there was a carousel house in the middle. And what was interesting here was the, the modeling of the surfaces came from the motion of the horses uh, combined with the Doppler effect of screaming at your mom and dad every time you went around the, the, the carousel, which we thought, like, that's the two most fun things about being on the carousel. It's not the creepy horse, right? So, um, uh, but what we did here, and it's really a shame that you can't see this, because we took the same model, but what we did was we changed the resolution on the model. So it was the same design, 
but just by altering how many panels of glass, this ended up being a $300,000 set of doors, a $200,000 set of doors, or a $120,000 set of doors. And so we began to think about using the digital to keep our buildings from being value engineered because we wouldn't lose the integrity of design, we just altered the resolution in order to make sure the budget was there so it couldn't get cut out. Now, shockingly, they picked the $120,000 set of doors, but you could see the patterning that we did, and then the, the, the building had all these um, operable, uh, all the doors worked on worm drives and actually respond to the microclimate. And you know, for our very first public project, this, this park, um, you know, we got it built and didn't lose anything in the process. And, and actually brought this thing so under budget because of our control of the digital and, and we're able to get all the detailing we wanted, everything we wanted in here, but we brought it in so under budget that the client authorized another piece in the park, which was a, they wanted a folly in the park and they picked a camera obscura. And only because we were able to bring the carousel house and the rest of the park in under budget did we get full design freedom on the camera obscura, which we then used as an R&D project for our office. So this is a few years later, but it's important in our, our digital evolution because it was the first time we actually scripted the performance of the building and let the building completely emerge from what it was supposed to do. So it had a, a desk and a door and it had a kind of throw for the, the camera and, and it just made this kind of minimum envelope. This we call BIM version 0 0.1 because we physically modeled all 2,200 pieces that went into this, into this small little pavilion. No two were alike. And then we made a set of drawings that either told, we, made, we wanted to see if every single, build, every single piece of this building could be fabricated by the computer. Nothing would be handmade. So there were two kinds of drawings. This is, you know, this is now 11 years ago. Um, drawings to tell the machines how to make it and then drawings to show how to put it together. And I'll walk away for one second. You know, these are actually from the CDs and it says, for those of you who can't read it, fold, weld, bolt, screw. That's it, like it's not that hard. So the contractors are looking at this complicated little building, but when they saw that we had thought about all these pieces, it was remarkable because for a public bid project where you have to go for the low bid according to New York State law, our four bids came in within 2% of each other because all the risk had been removed for the contractor and they totally understood what we were after and they understood the simplicity with which one could make a complex building. And it was pretty much an aha moment for us. The other aha moment for us with this was it was about a 30 page set and it wasn't until we went to the building department to get them approved that we looked at the set and realized that there were no dimension strings on anything because dimensions were suddenly irrelevant. Every single part arrived pre-cut, pre-slotted, pre-numbered, pre-drilled, ready to go together like the most kick-ass piece of Ikea furniture you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> so the building went together in six weeks and um, that's what it looked like. And, and you know, no one would ever say that you should build uh, an $800 million uh, a building or a skyscraper like this. But what we started to learn was that you could build a lot of your buildings in very kind of standard ways and then find the critical parts of the building where you use this technology. And suddenly you kind of amp the whole level of the architecture quite a bit. And it also gives you a strategic control that the contractors, I mean, a lot of them just can't understand it. So they can't start dumbing it down for you because if they dumb down one nut, the whole thing falls apart and the client blames them instead of blaming you. So it's a very strategic thing to do to begin to do these critical elements with this kind of control. Um, but, you know, I was looking for nature drawings, you know, because we're from the city. We don't have a lot of nature in our lives. But we did look, we did look at some of the inspiration for other projects where it was you know, we looked, at, we looked at flower growth and we looked at uh, shipbuilding. This was techniques for building liberty ships in World War II, which we found incredibly interesting. I mean, you know, uh, these, these are the, you know, skunk works are our idols. This is the way that we like to think about design and architecture. And, and thinking about uh, using um, um, barge building techniques in order to build large scale pieces of infrastructure. Um, this was a competition that we did for the Portland Aerial Tram in 2002 
Um, but you could see this was all they had a they had a dying barge industry, and we showed how they could revive the barge industry by building this piece of infrastructure. Um, we used the digital to begin to export and to do this was a project we did in in um, the Harry Valley at Hangil Sa in in South Korea. Um, again, the building was a series of poured in place concrete walls, but then the sort of magical part was this screen that wrapped up around and then curved inside the building itself. It was a bookstore that you entered in off the hillside and you sort of wrapped on a series of ramps that go around a three story high wall of books. So we turn the bookstore vertically, you move around and then you enter into different programs as you come down. But the trick was making a kind of very uh, uh, dumb but uh, accomplished joint piece that made it very easy for the builders to, to uh, take our, our digital drawings and convert them to this wood screen, um, which then you could see wraps and covers the front of the building and then creates this kind of glowing lantern at night. And this was the first time we were, we were a little obsessive in general by always being kind of on, on our projects and almost being the CMs. And this was the first time we had to sort of let our child go and see what happened uh, you know, when they came back from college, uh, pierced and tatted. So um, uh, there was also you know, experimentation with materials. Sometimes we worked in districts in New York where you were required to build in brick. And we really didn't have much interest in brick, but we wanted to see what could be done. So we thought about uh, CNC milling formwork. Uh, we wrote our own scripts to quickly test over 60 or 70 different versions of brick patterning and, and sine curve patterning. Uh, the, the negatives were CNC milled out of high density foam. The bricks were dropped in. The concrete was poured from behind and you pulled it out and you could get any kind of texture onto your bricks for nominal additional, additional costs. <clears throat> so, you know, some more successful than others, but we didn't care. We were learning something, we were playing with it, and we were using the digital to push what we could possibly do. So, thank God I'm in the present. Oh, that was really hard to do. That was, okay. Um, now, the present isn't really that fair because this is a little bit old, but the reason why it's in the present is because it's how we're sort of working right now. And I've presented this, this project a lot. I will do it quickly. But it was the key thing is this is when it went back to that whole point that I was talking about at PS1, where we started seeing, and it happened at the park in Greenport with that carousel house, where the carousel used to get 1,000 riders a month when it was in a butler building on the corner of Front and Main. But when it got moved into that glass pavilion with moving walls, it got 50,000 riders per month at $2 a ride. Suddenly it was generating 100,000 extra dollars for the town every year and they were using that money to fix up Main Street and plant flowers and clean the streets and the values in that whole town went up more than all the other surrounding towns because of architecture. So how do you begin to connect great design and think about it in terms of generating revenue, not to make money, not that that's bad, but it's really about thinking about what you could, like not talking about architecture only as something that spends money or wastes money or, or something only for a very special few. That in fact, if you're intelligent about it, great architecture could be for everyone. So what we decided to do was to see if we could be our own developer. Um, and there were a whole bunch of people chasing a six story, 100 year old warehouse building in the meatpacking district of New York. And a few of those people got the idea that it was built full for, to its full FAR six. And a bunch of people got the idea that the two buildings to the south were underbuilt and maybe you could buy those air rights and shift them on top. Now there was a height limit in the neighborhood and there was a setback requirement. And um, so the only way you could get the building a little bit bigger was to cantilever over the neighboring buildings, um, which a few people had that idea too. But the trick is that the more you cantilever, you have a sort of diminishing return because the, the, the structural costs get so high that you start to lose money the further you go out. Uh, working with Bureau Happold, we really developed a, a very inexpensive way of coupling three floors by bringing, putting all the lateral forces in the core and then getting the downward force here through the floors without um, uh, cross bracing. And um, just by getting it out a couple extra feet, it projected a little bit more revenue, which let us bid a little bit more for the building, which allowed us to win the building. So now we were going to have this sort of six-story historic building and six-story brand new building 
coupled in two to make a 10-story building in total. So we had to think about, well, what would that facade of the new building be? And our idea of contextuality for us was that we didn't want it to look like anything else. We wanted it to not look like its neighbor. And we wanted to test out the idea of metal. We had never built a metal building. And we came up with an idea of using um, a kind of zinc material and writing a series of scripts that looked at sort of blending all of the different windows so that it was unidentifiable which programmatic element was behind the wall. Um, the notion here was to take, uh, we, we actually looked at, we looked at what um, uh, uh, zinc, we went to zinc manufacturers and the cost was extraordinary. We couldn't understand why, but the interesting thing was that we said, well, zinc only cost about 10% more than steel and material is less than 50% of the whole thing. So it should really only cost 5% more, but you want to charge us 40% more. And they said, if you want a zinc facade, that's what you have to do. So we said, well, where does zinc come from? And they said, France, mostly. And so we went to France and we bought a thousand sheets of zinc that were one meter by three meters long and brought them back to New York. And we designed the entire building so that one unfolded sheet, two unfolded sheets, or three unfolded sheets would fit on perfectly on a one meter sheet of zinc. We did four window sizes, two light box sizes. It made about 21 or 22 proto shapes, about 400 different shapes of zinc in total, and 4,000 pieces of zinc completely. And used that to make, our, um, to make our rain screen system on the new part of the building. Um, this was the first time we went to the digital to help us really fabricate on a large scale. So using SolidWorks, instead of having to draw the 400 and something shop drawings that one would normally do, we just used SolidWorks to, to load everything into a spreadsheet. So you only had to make one drawing and then it would feed the differentiation directly from the spreadsheet to the laser cutter. So, Basically, no shop drawings, 4,000 pieces. They all arrived with coded systems that were laser cut onto the front, which became the instruction set for building the building. And we started on one corner and went all the way around and finished. And when we got back to the original spot, we were 1 32nd of an inch off with no shop drawings. And not only that, we brought in, the, the, the bid on the wall was about $80 a square foot. We delivered it for $43 a square foot. Um, so it was an amazing lesson for us on, on taking control, taking the risk, and just figuring it out how to do it yourself. Um, you can see the core got removed to the middle. There's two apartments per floor with three exposures on each side. There's a kind of lot of texture and moving in and out of the building. You can see the shape as it sort of sits perched on top there. One of the things we thought was really important to us was sort of this play of the, the, the glazing and, the, and the, the, the material wall. These are the light boxes that glow at night. Of course, one of the problems by setting the windows back is that you create ledges. And in New York, we have a pigeon issue. Um, so ledges were not a good idea. So we actually called the Museum of Natural History and asked them if there was an angle that a pigeon would not land on. And they said, yes, it's 34 degrees. And if you look on our, on our drawings, there's a, actually a 34 degree pigeon slide on the front of every single window. And um, it's remarkable because 10 years later, there's not one turd on the entire facade of the building. <laughs> uh, we did the collateral materials. We did the interiors. We brought it to market and we sold it. And at the end of the day, this building cost about 1% more than the absolute dumbest brick crap building you could possibly do in New York. But we had three competitors within two blocks of us, some well-known architects who designed at the same time. And our building averaged 17% more in the sales because of the design. And so it was the first time we had concrete evidence that did being smart, using technology, leveraging it together and taking risk, design could be a profit center and not just a cost center. And that design could be inspirational and it could allow a higher quality by leveraging the technology. So it's what the building looks like today on a, on a, at dusk. It was an amazing thing for us. And I've, I've talked about this before because 
a lot of people were concerned. Like a lot of people said, oh my God, you're getting in bed with the developer. This is the slippery slope to hell. You're gonna lose all your street cred as a designer. And the thing that we really truly learned from this was that actually the more we were engaged, the more we had money at risk and we were, our reputations were at risk and everything was at risk, the more design freedom we got. The more we explained to the, contract, to the, 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 the contractor and the, um, and the owner and the partners and the banks what we were doing and how we were trying to do it, the more they said, go ahead, build your building. And so it was a, it was a really valuable lesson for us. Um, another project that I wanted to show is the East River Waterfront. So this was a competition that we won to do a 1.8 mile stretch of, of Esplanade in Lower Manhattan. So this was our zone. Brooklyn Bridge Park was going out for a bit at the same time and Governor's Island was going out. And we talked to the Bloomberg administration and we said, look, instead of thinking of it as three separate parks, think of it as one park around a harbor. And if you look here, that's uh, the scale size of Central Park. So it's, it's quite large. But this was our, the conditions where we were. You've got the FDR drive above you. If you look, this is some of the only truly south-facing waterfront property in Manhattan. Um, and here's you know, the third largest central business district in the United States, five minutes away. But what was it being used for? To store garbage. Uh, uh, you had infrastructure blocking any possible way of coming through here. You had beautiful 18th century squares used for parking lots. We did surveys where here, here are housing and the water's on the other side of, the, of this shed. There were 14 layers of chain link fence between where people lived and the waterfront to keep people away, people who were desperate for some open space. So this was the idea that you had this one street that was active, a kind of service street, and then you had this wide street at South Street and the FDR drive above and then chain link fence and um, sheds out in, on the waterfront. So we said to the city, look, Get rid of as much parking as you can, plant trees wherever you can, get the bike lane through, and instead of complaining about this FDR drive above your head, think of it as a free roof that you could hang inexpensive walls from and start to have spaces that you could bring culture out to the waterfront. You can make rehearsal spaces, you can make community spaces, you could have restaurants, you could have lots of different things that wouldn't care about what would, what would be happening. And since you can't expand the size of the, of the, the piers, make every pier double-decker because you can't, you can't cast more shadows on the, on the river bottom, make them double-decker recreation piers and you get a sort of two-for-one, if you will, on, on open space. So um, uh, we, we did the design. Um, you could see the, the, the idea for the first prototypical double-decker pier, Pier 15. Um, this was at Pier 35, it sort of sh it hides a sanitation shed. Um, the pavilions as they eventually turned out. And uh, the first section of the park opened last summer, the first thousand feet of the 1.8 miles. Um, we uh, uh, convinced the, the city to paint the big girder under the FDR drive lavender. We hid all the lighting up inside the drive so it hits the lavender and casts this beautiful blue light. You have vertical LEDs on all of the railings. And then wherever there were historic slips, we uh, broke down the seawall and had steps that go right down to the water where you can touch it. Um, it, was, uh, it was seven years in the making to get the first one open. Um, one of my big pet peeves about waterfront um, esplanades are the fact that when you sit in a chair on a waterfront esplanade and you're right here on 18 inches, the 42 inch required handrail height is exactly in your line of sight. And um, it took five years, uh, but I convinced the city to build only bar seats along the, the East River. So the, the, the handrails actually go from six inches to 18 inches wide. The seats are up high, you sit high on there and you're nice and up and out and looking at the water. You can flip open your laptop, you can flip open the times, you can have lunch. And um, they were really suspicious of these things. Like I said, five years. Did you hear me? Five years um, to get these done. They're, um, uh, they are now the most popular uh, seats on the waterfront by far. And now they're like, oh, this is such a great idea we had. Let's do them everywhere. <laughs> so here you can see the first section at night. And then the rendering of the double-decker pier. 
Um, one of the features I love is the, the handicapped accessible ramp comes up and it creates this kind of amphitheater bowl that looks to the north where the historic ships of the South Street Seaport are. Because as a kid growing up in New York, I used to, my dad would take me down there. I was always bummed you had to look up at, this, at the boat. I always wanted to look down on the boat and see what was on the deck. So, so you can do that now. And um, it just opened uh, a, a, a couple months ago. Um, this is actually still a construction photo. Um, it's got this fabulous big red underbelly um, that glows at night. You can see the plantings just went in, the kind of cantilevered elements. The glass boxes that hold program have green roofs that become picnic lawns on the top as they slip through. Here you can see out at the end, um, we just got a, a whole array of chaise lounges out there. It's called the tanning deck. And um, here you can see one of the, the cuts down to the water. And that is not a rendering. That's what it looks like today as it glows at night. So it's got this great sort of rose colored pink light that bounces off the galvanized steel holding it up. You can look through and see the steel and it kind of casts down this uh, wonderful glow um, as you walk out onto the, out onto the pier. Um, another project we're working on right now, this was an international competition that we won to do a government complex uh, in Botswana, Africa. And the reason I bring it up was uh, about four years ago, we were hired by a company in, um, that has a small internet search engine located in Mountain View, California, to um, uh, think about building their world headquarters for them. And um, working with the founders, we really did some interesting research, really pushing the limits of what sustainability could be. We were, we were told that if we delivered LEED Platinum, we completely failed. They wanted three generations past lead platinum and we really worked on what that was. So the, the main concept was this idea of a giant energy blanket that was almost like a chassis one could install different technologies as it moved, the way parking worked, the sort of microclimates that developed, a whole series of, 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 of technologies, which were then uh, done in a purely parametric uh, a system where we wrote the code and allowed the client to change the priorities that they had they gave us 10 priorities and we showed them that if you mixed which priorities went in which order, the entire shape of the building would change. And we showed them the code, which was really scary, but we showed them the code and they then began to understand architecture because they then understood that the, the parameters and their order and significance would have a, a, a direct relate of performance versus form, something they never understood. So the building was amazing, it was an incredible project and then uh, the, 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 the financial crisis put the project on hold. But we took those ideas when we entered the competition to do the, the complex in Africa. And um, so we took the sort of two main elements of the Botswana landscape, the sort of the dune and the delta, and we thought about how you begin to slice those up and think about this complex as it relates to its natural landscape. And um, this is a kind of using a lot of the same ideas, but just running it in a very different climate. Um, we began to think about how one could think about this, this, this complex, which would become the, the, the sort of heart of an emerging high-tech industry for Botswana. Botswana is converting a lot of its diamond wealth into, um, into other industries, and this is one of the, the main ones that they want to sort of seed. So this is the first building, it's 350,000 feet as part of a 3 million square foot com uh, campus that we master plan. And one of my favorite elements of this is again, the parking is on grade, but we lifted the grade and burned it up uh, a level. And we left all the incredible trees on the site that were there. And what happens is they then come through from the parking and become these shading devices in the inner courtyards. Um, if you're in the shade in Botswana most of the time, most of the time of the year, it's actually quite pleasant. And then the sort of different um, elements of the buildings, the buildings are connected by these glass bridges that then go through the treetops. So the, the project progressed as we worked on it. Um, but again, using technology in the digital, I mean, obviously, all of the buildings have a, a strong ecological component. But thinking about the prototyping, the way in which we look at the materials and how they get put together, how those get assembled and placed uh, onto the building to create these different effects, kind of view of the roof. This will be the largest green roof in South Africa and the kind of view 
from the overhangs um, on the north side. Um, on the interiors, we were looking at basket weaving techniques, broke down the performance elements of those, uh, got parametric models going for those basket weaving techniques, and then began to think of how you would use them for ways of sort of articulating the interior surfaces of key performance elements um, in the building. So again, using the parameters, changing the materials, thinking about the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the cost effectiveness, prototyping the materials right in our office, looking at the connection joints, making things that were easy to do. This is starting to go automatically, but that's all right. I'll just, I may have to flip back and forth a little bit. Um, and the kind of entry sequence and the building as a whole. Unfortunately, or maybe not so, uh, the building is on hold for a couple months while they sort out a small little corruption scandal. <laughs> um, I've been assured by one of your students who's from the area that this is a very typical thing to happen. Um, but uh, where the court date, I think, was today. So we'll see, we'll see what happened, but hopefully it'll, and they've already started building it, and they've, the government has assured us they're gonna continue it, they just need to fire the correct people and then continue moving on. <laughs> and they told us shop is not one of the people on the list to possibly be fired, fortunately. Um, so, so as that moves on, you know, <clears throat> we were doing all of this work, and to get these buildings built, and I, I mean, I skipped over just a few of things that we're working on right now, but. It was always for us sort of getting involved in the construction, get, using the digital and the paradigm shift of the emergence of technologies in order for us to begin to grab back these territories that had been sort of systematically given away, not for financial gain, not for uh, folly, but really to save the design of the buildings. And we found the more that we were involved in the, in the construction, the more our buildings got built the way we intended them to get built. Now, the problem was, was that we ended up doing a lot of that work for free because they were like, well, aren't, you're just protecting your design, aren't you? And they would just, you know, but somehow they would pay the CM, but we were doing their job. So because of that, we started, four years ago, we started a, a firm called Shop Construction, which is staffed by mostly architects, but also people from the construction industry, also uh, uh, computer scientists, script writers, um, uh, environmentalists. And the interesting thing was that by splitting it apart, they became consultants to us, we became consultants to them, and they became consultants to other architects and to other contractors. So a lot of the things that they do, and this is only because of the emerging technologies, is, is this even possible, was because large-scale construction firms didn't know how to use the emerging technology, so they would hire shop construction to help them build buildings. So there's a lot of things that they work on. They, they work in the design phases, they work during construction, and then even in post-construction with helping, using the technology to help people manage their buildings in total. Um, those are all the software packages we use in SHOP. Um, and the green arrows are ones that are used by the architects, and the purple arrows are the ones that are used by SHOP construction. And it's remarkable because we'll swap in and out for whatever software works the best on whatever element that is. But, but by having sort of both sides of it, it really helps us to manage the complexity. And, you know, shop construction's argument is like, this is the old way of dealing with complexity, right? Just the overlays and looking at it. And, and now this is the way that we're starting to manage getting all the systems into a building. This is from our FIT project, uh, which was an incredibly complex lab system where we only had nine foot six ceilings. So it was literally down to the 16th of an inch on getting all this stuff in. You know, going from, from the old way of doing things uh, to the sort of iRooms, which are installed on every one of our projects. Um, all the different kinds of things that one can now use the model for, because you're developing this model as a design tool, you're developing it as a construction tool, you can now sell it as a management tool. And that's really one thing that architects need to really be thinking about because it not only keeps you in contact with the client long term, but you've produced all this work that has incredible value going forward. So, you know, whether it's, it's giving, uh, uh, using the model, the design model to help the contractors with construction sequencing, um, you know, thinking about document extraction, tracking, uh, clash detection is pretty simple and straightforward, uh, real-time tracking where, where the guys actually go out in the field and measure every single thing that went in and you actually get a recorded animation of how the building went together, 
when you have to fix something in the future, you've got the information, you know exactly what needs to come apart and take it apart. And just getting rid of paper and getting everything on. We just, was it yesterday? Two days ago, had a six hour meeting with a really forward thinking construction firm that came to us because they said they wanna do the first fully paperless construction site. No paper allowed on the site at all, not even to take notes. They wanted everything and they asked us, they wanna hire us to be a consultant for them on how they could do it. And they believe that it will knock 10 to 20% off of the construction cost. Just getting rid of paper and the paper trail and the kind of misses in the way that, that live information is fed. It's also incredibly important for sustainability and tracking the buildings and watching how they perform. You know, how many miles a gallon does your building get? And how do you begin to improve the performance of the buildings over time, especially for universities or large institutional clients, watching how their buildings perform and knowing each thing that they need to do on the subsequent building by using these models that we produce as designers in different ways and expanding those territories, there's unbelievable value. We believe this has 10 times the value of hanging photovoltaics all over the building. This is really where you can have a large impact. Uh, for, for asset man life cycle management, capital projects, it's amazing that what we can do. And this is all stuff that we're kind of naturally good at because we're designers and spatial thinkers and we're generalists. And it's using that technology to expand out from what we normally think pure architecture really is. So what's the future? Um, I, will, I will talk about it. I mean, SHOP, again, has always tried to just think about what those other opportunities are for how to use what we do so well. As I said, we're an amazing generalist. Our mindset is about being generalists. We're the, we're the ones who are out on the site that understand so many different things, but yet we keep trying to focus ourselves just as these kind of producers of imagery, right? And I just think that's such a short-sighted way to think about what our profession has to offer. And so, I mean, this is about shop, but it could be about anyone, you know? whether it's software we're trying to design or architecture, some of the development we've joint ventured on, construction, um, uh, helioptics is our, our dynamic um, uh, solar curtain wall. We just landed our first major investor on that, um, which I can't really talk about, but um, it's really remarkable. It's gonna go on their buildings and it's a, it's, it's, it's this, it's a photovoltaic wall that you can see through. So you can skin the entire south facade of a skyscraper in it. And instead of getting like 17% conversion of sun energy, it's getting the Department of Energy tests are coming back at about 45. So it's, it's working. It's negative, there's a negative, there's a but in there. So the but is, it's really expensive. But um, <laughs> yeah, we'll figure that out. So um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna try something for a second and swap out of this just to show you one other thing. Um, so this is the prototype of our new software that we've developed. Um, it's called Envelope, and let me see if this works. So you could put any uh, address in. So it's an idea, this was something that we used to do all the time. We would have clients call us all the time, and they'd ask us to analyze sites, and they'd ask us to do different things, and um, you know, what you can do is you can put any address, we're starting with New York City, and you click on the sites, and you can see on the right who owns it, and you know, how much has it been built and what's the maximum it can be built. So you immediately can analyze just by looking at this, like what available rights there are to build on these sites. So let's say you pick a series of sites. Um, let's try that, let's try this one, okay. So you select the site and the software begins to automatically read the zoning code and the building code for you and tells you, well here it's telling you that you're on two different sites. Do you want to apply it all? Yes. It tells you what you're allowed to build. Do I want to do a residential, mixed use? What your FARs for each one? It gives you all of the bonuses that are available. So you say, I'd like residential would be my primary thing. And let's say I want four floors of commercial. This is all the bonuses that are possible. So you can pick if I want quality housing, plaza bonus, alternate front setback. I'll do inclusionary housing. Now, you could ask some of the architects from, from who've worked in New York, this takes a very expensive landscape architect or a very, a very expensive, I'm sorry, um, uh, land use attorney or a very expensive architect many hours to figure out. And it's done. This probably takes four to six hours typically. It now takes 60 seconds. 
and you can look at your building, how it gets masked out on the zoning. If you want to fool around with it, you can, whoops, you can sort of change it. Let's say I want to toggle, like, huh, what happens if I have 18 foot floor to floor ceilings? Done. And you immediately see what it is. You hit your floor plate breakdown, so it feeds directly into your, um, into your uh, spreadsheets for your development, and then it outputs uh, in a file format so you can drop it into CAD or, or into Revit to do it. So um, this is the kind of stuff that we're trying to work on and push, let's get out of there. <laughs> it is a prototype. <laughs> Um, but again, this is something that we would do every day in the office over and over and over again. And so you've got, we try to hire as many different minds in, in, in shop as possible. And so here you are with, um, we'll get back to the, here you are with, um, you know, we've got finance guys, we've got, we've got architects, we've got designers, we've got script writers, we've got land use attorneys. And we're all sitting around going, why are we doing this over and over again? Why don't we just write a software to solve this problem? Everyone needs to use it. Um, so uh, we worked on it for four years to get it that far. And uh, it's working. And we actually, this week, um, uh, just hired our invest an investment bank who wants to represent us because they think that this is going to be a major piece of software. And we've gone to the top developers in New York who all want to invest in it because they see it as a tool that's not, and this is what I thought was fascinating, I did not get this. They said, yeah, 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 it's gonna make money by people using it as a subscription and, and saving them thousands of dollars every time they do this analysis. They said the real value is that there's so much opacity and complexity in the exchange of property because of all the rules that they believe the number of transactions, real estate transactions, is going to go wildly up. They said just in the way the invention of the Excel spreadsheet, or the spreadsheet, it was Lotus 1, 2, 3 at the time, fueled the uh, leverage buyout industry in the 80s because suddenly sensitivity analysis was, be, was able to be understood and it, it literally, Wall Street quadrupled in the number of volume just because that software got in. They believe a software like this or other softwares that I hope you guys are inventing in the next year or two could do the same thing. And so again, it's taking those ideas, using technology, using design ideas, and pushing the limits of what you could do. So the last project I'll show you is Barclays Center, and a little bit about how we're using technology to build it. For those of you who may or may not know, the Barclays Center is an arena um, at, uh, at the corner of Flatbush and Atlantic. Am I okay time-wise? All right, it'll be like eight, seven minutes? Okay. Um, six minutes? Um, so uh, we had a volume. Um, I'll tell the story very quickly. It was a project that was designed by Frank Geary, a complex of a basketball arena with 16 towers around it. The basketball site was four towers with large scale foundations is sort of the easiest way to understand it with a bowl that sat in the middle. It was a brilliant scheme by Mr. Geary. The problem was in 2008 and 2009, when you couldn't finance the four towers around it, you suddenly had a bowl that was sitting there by itself. And the building had to be in the ground by the end of 2009 before the tax laws changed, or it would be a, a many, many hundreds of millions of dollars hit for the client. It wasn't enough time to redesign the building. So the client ended up going to a design build contractor, Hunt Construction, who said the only way you could do it is to go to a, 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 a firm that we've built a basketball arena for before, which was Ellerby Beckett, now part of AECOM. They do very good buildings. They picked out Indianapolis, they went to all of their buildings, they picked Indianapolis, they took it, they put it in New York, and they ordered the steel <laughs> so that they could get it in the ground. The problem was that the city felt like they got a little bit baited and switched in a swap from a Geary building to the Ellerby Beckett building. It was a much more conservative kind of design, brick and arch, more like a field house. So um, the client came to us and said, could you strip the building down all the way to the steel and think about redesigning it? And if you can, we'll give you seven weeks to redesign the entire building, detail it, and cost it. <laughs> and if you could do it for less than an X delta, the project is yours. So that should take about 11 months, and we said no problem. 
and I hope I never have a summer like that again. Um, so the idea that we did was we went for a kind of more horizontal organization of the building. A main thing was to really, there's this great plaza, almost acre plaza on the front to accentuate, pack retail around the sides, accentuate the views from the concourse levels out, and then to extend the, the sort of horizontal element to make this sort of grand gesture or canopy that extends out onto the platform with a large oculus in the middle of it. Um, so one of the, there's also a nine subway lines and a railroad station underneath the site. So there's this major transit exit. And the idea was that you could come in and you'd see this big uh, cantilevered element over here. And this is what the building looked like with the giant uh, cantilever. This is about 80 feet by 130 feet and it's 35 feet in the air. And there you can see the oculus and the upper halo and the transit uh, exit right here. <laughs> Um, so again, this idea of, of doing it in these uh, folded plate steels that float outside the enclosure of the building, kind of like a snakeskin uh, uh, bag. You could see the elements as they came around. And then one of the great design features of the building is that from the public space, you can see right into the scoreboard. So at all times, you can look into the bowl. Here you can see the view. There's the scoreboard, and there's this large sort of opening seeing the bowl from the public space. And we put all of the digital signage on the inner ring of the, uh, of the, of the oculus so it doesn't blare out into the neighborhood. Um, you look up through there, it could, it could play anything. Uh, you could show movies up there. It could be a live feed from Prospect Park. Um, then the steel, the idea was that the steel ribs wrap inside and become the ceiling and lighting elements inside the concourses. Um, and then to sort of move away from the kind of airport architecture sort of aesthetic, we really went for a kind of minimalist, almost Donald Judd boxes, if you will, sort of of the, of the, the, the weathered steel in a kind of all black uh, background. Um, that was the concourses. The bowl is almost completely black and dark gray. It's much more like black box theater. Um, some of the clubs and the kind of like, you know, minimalist elements of boxes of wood. This is the beer bar, if you will. Um, Jay-Z is one of the owners of the Nets, so we get to work with him on the club spaces. He's an amazing guy, really, really thoughtful and really interested in space and architecture and events and stuff. Terrific to work with. Um, but the idea was like, how can we actually build this thing, right? And we had seven weeks to figure it out. Um, so it ended up being 12,000 different shaped pieces of steel unfolded. Here are the unfolds of the three pieces. We modeled it in Katia ourselves and we worked very closely with shop construction on all this and then shop construction took over a lot of the, the, the building elements of this and it was this kind of proto form of what the panels would be. And shop construction ended up making a, uh, becoming a subconsultant to the, um, to the facade manufacturer themselves. Produced all the tickets. Um, we figured out how to lay out the panels, uh, did, did all the layout summaries. We did maximize the use of the material, actually developed the coil widths, which was something like 59 and 3 eighths of an, three -eighths of an inch was the most efficient way that we could cut all the pieces. They were all cut by um, water jet. So again, you see the enclosure and then the kind of skin that floats outside. We helped uh, work with ASI to produce, to build a um, uh, 20,000 foot facility in Indianapolis where all of the panels are cut and then hung on a dry cleaning rack where they take four months to go through the facility and they go through 15 wet dry cycles a day uh, to get the patina. And at the end of four months, they have eight years of patina on them. So here you can see the pieces, here you can see the rails. These were our first uh, 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 test mock-ups. But you could see the kind of complexity of the different numbers of shape. And by managing that information, we didn't get any value engineering on that facade at all. We were able to get it because we were in control of the way in which these things got put together. But you know, it's a lot to keep track of. So we tagged every single element and we wrote an iPhone app that you could go up to any panel at any time, go with your iPhone and scan it, and a three, the 3D model comes up, and you could tell exactly where every panel is in the cutting process, 
in the weathering process, which mega panel it was on, if that mega panel, where it was between Indianapolis and New York, if it was laying out in the yard, and then the sequence as to where it was being put up, including like green meant that it was up, yellow meant it was in the yard, uh, orange meant it was in the yard, red meant it wasn't. It's all these different levels in the weathering process. So again, it, the great thing is the complete transparency, using technology so that everyone from the guy with a wrench to the client could know what was going on on the site at all times. So here you can see the building going up. Here are the panels as they're getting installed. You can see the sort of, you know, snake skin meets Sarah aesthetic. And the, the, the sizes change based on the zoning requirements of the amount of light and transparency. So the patterning is all responding to the programming happening behind the wall. And then everything, now the most complicated part, where we are today, I think they just sent off the last drawings on Friday. I don't, I'm terrified to see the bar bill after that day, but um, they, the, the guys got it out. Um, I mean, we managed, helped manage the connection types. We even did modeling of the sequencing of construction so that they understood how to put it together. Um, this is the inside of the Oculus. So this is the digital board working with uh, Dactronics and the different metal pieces and the complexity of how this goes together. We even did three-dimensional scans, point cloud scans of the building to make sure every plate was in the right spot. We found more than 50 that weren't. And by changing them months in advance, we didn't have any delays in the installation of all of the pieces. And then uh, after doing a pretty good job getting this together, the client asked us to look at the first three towers behind there. Um, so they wanted to start to think about building 1.7, the first 1.7 million square feet of, of residential space. And the client challenged us to see if we could make these the three tallest modularly constructed buildings in the world. And so uh, we worked with Arup uh, and a firm called Excite. And together we've been working on this for more than a year. Um, and this is the sort of whole workflow of how you build the modular buildings. Shop construction is a key, a key partner in making this happen. Um, but you see the modules, so this is what they would be where you get the kind of uh, frame. You begin all the kitchens and bathrooms will be made as pods that get dropped in. You'll get your floors, your electrical, your heating and air conditioning, and including the facade will be done in a factory in Brooklyn, a union factory in the Brooklyn Navy Yard, and driven the 20 blocks from the factory and then stacked up on the site. So here you can see the brace frames coming up through. Those are not modularly constructed. And then you see all the modules as they go up. You can see each module as it, is in the, as it sits in the assembly and what the buildings will look like when they're done. So there's multiple facade types getting the shifts in and out of, the, of the, the cantilevers. And this is going to be 33 stories, 25 stories, and 54 stories for, for B4. And again, the tallest one ever done was 21 stories in 1968 in London. So um, you know, it's pretty exciting for us to push this now. And this is definitely where we see the future of what's going on in architecture and building. And you know, this is, we believe this is gonna knock 15% out of the price. And why is it important to, make, to knock 15% out of the price of the building? It's the only way to get affordable housing into New York City. It's the only way to make the numbers work where you can get the banks to back, back you to make that kind of affordable housing without public subsidies. So again, it's using technology for a social purpose, for an environmental purpose, for a design purpose, for art purposes, and also, quite frankly, so that our profession can use that, it's, it's this, as I said before, this paradigm shift is incredible. It is an opportunity for every one of us to go out there and grab back the territories that we have systematically given away through the AIA, quite frankly, and through the legal profession over these years. And we have got to return to being the master builder. We have the skills, we can take the risk, and we can have an incredibly positive effect on how our cities get built. Thank you very much.